133rd episode of the Atlas Society Asks. My name is Jennifer Anju Grossman. My friends call me JAG. I am the CEO of the Atlas Society. We are the leading nonprofit organization introducing young people to the ideas of Ayn Rand in fun, creative ways like animated videos and graphic novels. Today, we are joined by Jean Lenzer. Uh, before I even get into introducing our guest, I want to remind all of you who are joining us on Zoom, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, you, YouTube, you can use the comment section to type in your questions. As always, go ahead, get started, and uh, you'll be at the top of the queue. We'll get to as many of them as we can. So our guest today, Jean Lenzer, she is an award-winning independent investigative journalist and author whose work has appeared in medical journals such as the BMJ and the Journal of Family Practice, as well as the New York Times, Washington Post, Smithsonian Magazine, and The Atlantic. She is the author of The Danger Within Us, America's Untested, Unregulated Medical Device Industry, and One Man's Battle to Survive It, which explores threats to medical science that undermine public health. Uh, what really also caught my eye is uh, Jean has brought a unique perspective um, coming from that of an investigative journalist to bear on the uh, COVID lockdowns and things like vaccine mandates. Uh, which is informed by her research over the past three decades into the intersection of government, money, and medicine. So, Jean, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. So, um, you have a rather unique origin story. Could you share a bit about what originally led you to pursue medicine as a career and then the events and the discovery process that led you to switch fields to become an investigative journalist? Yeah. Well, um, I was very interested in the physician associate program at Duke University. It was the first to start training people uh, to treat patients where there were shortages of physicians. And um, uh, it wasn't long after I graduated from the program and started working that I started to realize that uh, there were some very serious illusions in medicine. And uh, I mean, I was absolutely captivated. Um, and one of the first things that I stumbled into is exactly what led me. Um, it was one of the things that led me to uh, leave practice and, and work as an investigative journalist. And, and when I talk about medical illusions, I'm talking about things where we really believe that the data show us and that we have the evidence and that we're doing the right thing and that we're saving lives, only to find out later that we were actually causing more harm than good. And um, one of the examples that, that just killed me was I was working solo in these rural ERs where um, patients would come in with chest pain. And I did like all physicians are trained to do across the country, guidelines from the American Heart Association were that patients who had chest pain should be treated to prevent this certain type of abnormal heartbeat. So there are these premature beats called PVCs. And if people are developing a heart attack and they have a PVC, it can trigger, it can touch off a deadly rhythm, ventricular fibrillation, where they'll be dead within minutes. So we routinely gave these medicines to stop these PVCs. And it was amazing because, I mean, I, I don't know how many times I've ordered the drug for chest pain patients and watched whatever PVCs they have just melt away. They disappear. It's fantastic. We knew that those abnormal beats were associated with higher mortality. So surely we were saving lives by stopping these abnormal beats. It took more than a decade of this drug being on the market and recommended by the AHA before they bothered to do a study that actually looked at the difference between whether you gave people the drug, a whole class of drugs um, that were similar to lidocaine versus placebo. And what they found was fascinating. Even though they did get rid of the PVCs, people who were treated with the drug were 3.6 times as likely to die as patients given placebo. And this just started me on a whole pathway of looking at it, you know, if, if, if 
if we were um, misled about this, if we didn't see this, how many other things were we missing? And I found that there are illusions like this in virtually every aspect of medicine. And I've written, actually, one of my favorite articles that I've written was in Smithsonian about this very issue of medical illusions. And um, I give a lead example there, a very different type. But but that's what led me to investigative journalism. I was fascinated by why didn't we know this? Why didn't we see this as clinicians? And what kept this happening? And that's where I started to see the collision of medicine and science. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, of money and science and how money often played a role in distorting what we thought was science. Yeah, well, I, I thought it was interesting in, in reading your book, um, how it's not just, you know, this anecdote or uh, this particular scandal, but you really put it into a context of what were some of the things that happen to change the way that that uh, medical care is delivered and a lot of that was driven by public policy changes so um, so it's a very interesting area of uh, of research on on multiple levels and I think for this audience that is interested in philosophy and interested in politics um, it's uh, it's it's really terrific now uh, you wrote in, um, in uh, Mother Jones in 2001, questioning whether corporate donations to the American Heart Association might have influenced um, its drug line, drug guidelines. Yeah. Do you think such influence happens more or less uh, in a post-COVID world as you look back two decades? You know, I don't know that it's any more or less likely to happen in terms of industry influence. Industry influence is ubiquitous. And multiple studies show over and over that um, when industry conducts studies, they're much more likely to come out with positive outcomes for their products and much more likely to sort of ignore and even um, to conceal the harms of their drugs or devices. So um, industry is an issue. I mean, they they uh, spread their largesse everywhere um, to patient groups, to politicians, to the FDA, uh, and unbeknownst to most people, to the CDC, to the NIH. So that's a problem in and of itself. But um, COVID, what it has done is to, I think, make people more amenable to lowering standards of science. And historically, that's a real problem. We have examples that we should have learned from the past. And one example was what happened during the AIDS uh, epidemic when uh, that's when they started dismantling the rules of science at FDA. And uh, Greg Gonsalves is one of the people as an AIDS activist and ACT UP. He was one of the ones who fought mightily to lower the standards saying, we can't wait for two randomized control trials. We need results now. Well, after years of finding that, you know, rushing science doesn't work. I mean, you can sometimes spend more energy getting people to study a problem and come to a quicker conclusion, but you can't force it. You can't force discoveries. And the rules of science still have to stand. And that's exactly what he's come to. Now he's an epidemiologist at Yale arguing that the FDA needs to strengthen its standards and that it should not be lowering standards. One of my favorite books of all time is Aerosmith. And that's all about um, how, again, money interfered because they were anxious to get a vaccine out during a pandemic. And they wanted this guy to just promote this vaccine before it was ready to be promoted. And that was 100 years ago. All the same forces that we're talking about right now, money, medicine, and science, just not, you, you can't study gravity and say, it's going to happen because I decided it's going to happen. Well, that's very much in line with objectivism. And as Ayn Rand says, you can evade reality, but you can't evade the consequences of evading reality. Um, and interesting that you used uh, both the AIDS epidemic and um, what happened with uh, with the COVID interventions and vaccines as examples of lowering standards of science, who, of course, was a pivotal figure uh, during both of those um, episodes as uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci. So perhaps we can get to that a little bit later on. But I also wanted to touch on another piece that you wrote uh, an opinion piece that you co-authored with Shannon Brownlee in Scientific American 
entitled The COVID Science Wars, uh, which I understand <laughs> triggered attacks on the article and attacks on you uh, personally. Um, Scientific American then published a set of false and misleading corrections, if I understand, to the article. Thank you for so putting that in. <laughs> Please <laughs> tell, tell, us what, uh, tell us what happened. Yeah, it's pretty disturbing. Um, so our article, the gist of it was that we need everyone at the table. Science doesn't advance by saying we're only going to listen to one set of witnesses. We're not going to listen to this other set of witnesses. And we gave a historical example um, related to cholera, where two different scientists came at it with very different points of view about what caused it. And the important thing is that both of them had a piece of the truth and both sides had something important to say. And we were just saying, you know, don't shut down um, one side of this conversation. Now, um, the side that was being shut down largely was anyone who dared to say that we shouldn't lock down. And, and that was within the medical community. I mean, it's very different in the lay community, but within the medical community it was largely accepted. You must lock down and you must use masks and you must use these vaccines, et cetera, et cetera. And um, Sweden was pointed to as a total disaster. And we were just saying, wait a minute, let's get data first. Let's understand this. Let's hear everybody out. Well, what happened next is that rather than discussing those issues, we got attacked saying that we had um, somehow had this conflict of interest because two of the people we cited and quoted were John Yonidas and Vinay Prasad, two physicians of some renown very respected, who both published um, important uh, works. And um, the conflict was allegedly because I had co-authored uh, with, and I think Shannon had too, we had co-authored with Dr. Yonidas and Dr. Prasad in the academic literature years ago. I mean, it's like six or eight years ago, we published an article. Now, there's no money that changed hands. There's no... I, I can, I, I couldn't get a promotion as a journalist because, you know, I, did, I mean, there, there was no conflict of interest. And yet, despite the fact that there was no conflict, when we first published about Yonidas in um, Undark, the, the magazine associated with the MIT, um, I sent them an email saying, look, out of an abundance of caution, I just want you to know that I did co-author with these guys. And so they said, OK, we'll make this an opinion piece. Well, after the firestorm broke out, and it was a firestorm of attack that somehow I had this terrible conflict of interest, um, uh, Undark acted as if we had never notified them. But I had the email. I have the email where they acknowledged me saying it to them and where they even said, OK, we'll make sure this is listed as an opinion piece. And then Scientific American um, exacerbated the whole problem by repeating the lie that Undark had which was that we hadn't declared. Now, also, Scientific American had given us a conflict of interest form. We answered every single question. They never asked about, did you ever publish a scientific article? Because nobody ever asked that. That's not considered conflict of interest. So the whole thing was clearly politically based. It was not based in science. It was not based on anything that we quoted wrong or did wrong. It was an attack because we dared to um, say, let's hear out these both sides. Right, really. Uh a position of uh, a free speech and its importance to scientific progress. <laughs> so um, pr pretty, pretty insane. So um, we have been following carefully uh, the Swedish experiment. Uh, I had Johan Anderberg who wrote uh, uh. The Herd on our program uh, from Sweden, journalist over there. Um, who talked yes. about? I'm sorry, behind, I missed that. I've heard him. Yes, yeah, the behind the scenes of of, of what happened and and how the, the leaders in that country just resisted incredible pressure, very very Howard Rourke, uh, to turn away from what they they were you know interpreting the science and saying that this is actually the the best way to proceed. So um, you uh, and a good friend of the Atlas Society. Uh, Dr. Jeffrey Singer um, were on a panel for Cato, uh, which I thought was very, 
very moderate, you know, very reasonable. <laughs> this is not uh, exactly a, a bunch of ideologues at, by any stretch, people coming from, from different perspectives, from journalism, um, from epidemiology. Uh, and I would love to, the panel focused comparing on uh, Sweden's response to COVID to that of the United States. Could you please expand on why you think that COVID deaths aren't necessarily a consistent way for countries to measure the effectiveness of uh, COVID interventions? There's actually multiple reasons not to rely on COVID deaths, not to compare them. Um, one would be age alone, the demographics of a society. So say in Swaziland, the uh, lifespan there is 49 years of age. 75% of COVID deaths in the U.S. occur in people over the age of 75. And that's true throughout the world. It was really a disease of the elderly. So if you don't have any elderly people, you can have a very low COVID death rate in general. That's one aspect if you don't have older people. The other thing is socioeconomic status uh, in a poor country. Everything is worse if you're poor, whether it's cancer, heart disease, suicide, whatever it is, if you're poor, it's worse. So um, that changes what the outcome is likely to be. And a third reason is just reporting. Now, among wealthy nations, it's pretty standardized, you know, all cause mortality. In other words, every single death is recorded and it's recorded in a relatively timely way where you can understand what's happening to people. Um, but uh, COVID deaths for those, I just gave three different reasons, you know, that you may see variables. Um, it's really not the way to go. So what we did was suggest that we use uh, uh, all, all cause, cause mortality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that, so uh, do you want me to go into that now? Yeah, yeah. Well, I was going to mention your um, you referenced the Kaiser study that showed that Sweden had almost no excess deaths for those under seventy five. So, yeah, I would love to to hear more about why excess uh, mortality is an important uh, benchmark and and maybe just some insights into what's going on with uh, all, ca all cause mortality in the different countries and their different approaches. So I was dumbfounded when I came across this Kaiser Family Foundation study. And the reason I was dumbfounded wasn't because I was surprised. I actually wasn't that surprised at the outcome. I was shocked because nobody reported the findings of the Kaiser. I mean, Kaiser is used by outlets all around the globe. So I asked the lead author, you know, I mean, have you been contacted by any media? And she said, no. Nope. There was just no zero reporting on it. And what was so astounding was the outcome, as you pointed out, that there was no excess mortality in people under the age of 75 in Sweden. So how can that be? Well, it's not like there were no COVID deaths among uh, younger people. There were some. But as people stayed home voluntarily, there were perhaps fewer deaths from uh other infectious diseases or from COVID or from car accidents. So basically it stayed basically the same. And the way you look at this all-cause mortality translated as excess mortality. And I'm going to explain that. So with excess mortality, what you do is you look, they took the five years prior to the pandemic and you get the average number of deaths in that five-year period. And it, say a country has a million deaths per year on average. And then during the pandemic, the first year of the pandemic, there are 1.3 million deaths instead of 1 million deaths. Then there's a 30% excess mortality. And what's so valuable about excess mortality is it includes not just the bump from COVID deaths, but it includes all the knock-on effects of lockdown. And what was really important about the study was that it was in the year 2021 before the vaccines came out. So the only measures countries could take were public health measures, lockdown and other measures like that, distancing, whatever. So what you saw was the effect of lockdown and the knocked on effects. If people didn't go to the ER when they had a heart attack because they were scared to go or because they were committing suicide at higher rates or because they were turning to drugs. And that's exactly what happened in the United States was a dramatic escalation in drug overdose deaths, in homicides, um, just uh, and there were effects. People have heart attacks and people have strokes and things that they just weren't getting diabetes, things that got out of control. 
So that was a really valuable metric. And what the Kaiser Family Foundation did was they looked at 11 wealthy nations, peer nations. So we're looking at like, I think it was like England, Australia, Sweden, uh, New Zealand, uh, France, et cetera. And um, it was the only, Sweden was the only country that had no excess mortality under the age of 75. Now they were heavily criticized for having um, deaths in, in the elderly and, and, and they them criticize themselves about, you know, not moving fast enough in nursing homes. However, even though they had uh, some excess mortality among um, those over 75, I think I have a, countries here, they still did better. I don't know where it is. They still did better than something like eight other. So out of the 11 nations, they did better than either seven or eight. I think they placed like eight in doing well, um, doing better than all these other countries. And effectively, what we did with our lockdown was we transferred the harms of this con of this pandemic, both physically and financially from the elderly to young people. So if we had done what the Barrington folks suggested, which was focused protection, focus it on the people where it's needed the most in nursing homes for the elderly and let younger people go about their lives. Instead, we scared the wits. I mean, saw kids just terrified, living in fear. They lost a couple of years of school. They were living in fear. They turned to drugs and it's just, it's insanity. And this is where, you know, it, it makes me sad that we couldn't just talk about what we needed is civil discourse. And that's what Shannon and I were arguing for in our Scientific American article, is that we need to just look at data and not make emotional accusations. Well, you're just out to kill people. I don't think any physician or public health expert or anybody who makes a recommendation either for or against lockdown wants to kill people. I believe that my colleagues who really believe in lockdown, they want to save lives. That's what they believe. I believe differently. But I think the answer to this is to discuss the numbers, the data that we have, and discuss those data honestly. And unfortunately, you know, I'm a I, I'm on the other side of the fence here. I'm a lefty. And unfortunately, it was my progressive and lefty friends who were attacking me and others who would dare to say, we got to look at the numbers, not not these emotional things about it's the right thing to do. <laughs> well, that was, uh, you know, one of the reasons uh, that I particularly wanted to have you come on um, because I, I'm hoping that people that have uh, kind of made their cognitive commitments on these issues because of partisanship or ideology might be able to hear it or be, be open-minded hearing what you have to say and, and might be mistrustful of some of, of what I might have to say. <laughs> I actually want my parents who, yeah. uh, who are quite liberal Democrats to be able to, uh, to, to listen to what you are, are bringing to bear because it is um, unfortunate that, uh, that this has become such a politicized issue. But I, I do also appreciate that you're the sort of open objectivist, benevolent approach to saying, I'm not going to attack your motives and I'm, I'm not uh, going to um, just pick a, pick a fight with you, but, I, but I'm open-minded. As David Kelly says, if uh, we are right, we have nothing to fear. If we're wrong, we have something to, to learn. So um, the only thing I have to fear is going to be our audience getting angry with me because I'm um, hogging up our time here and there are a lot of really great questions that are coming in. So uh, Caitlin Temer on Instagram is asking, Jean, what was the most difficult issues you had to face in your medical investigations? Blowback from industry. I mean, there's no question about it. Their power is enormous. And um you know, they, they can make life very, very difficult and their threats are pretty continuous. And, and I, I, you know, I've, I've tracked a number of medical whistleblowers, doctors who have seen bad things happen, and I've seen what industry has done to them. And it's, it can be rough. They play rough. Adam Martinez on Facebook says, do we have an idea of how much our medical establishment is just a mouthpiece for big pharma? 
You know, it's difficult. I mean, that's one of the things that that I find so distressing is that, you know, I went into medicine because there are good things that medicine does. And it's there's nothing more wonderful than to see a kid who's, you know, on the verge of dying from an asthma attack and you pull them right out of it or a diabetic and you can get them right back. Um, you know, so they're great things, uh, but uh, industry is everywhere and they are tremendously exaggerating um, outcomes and benefits. Um, and and I'm actually tracking a story right now where a uh, lead scientist at one of the drug companies acknowledged that they simply changed the deaths of patients, the causality, so that it wouldn't look like it was from their product. Just simply changed them. Didn't even talk to the doctors who made the diagnoses. They just changed it. So it's it's a problem. It's serious. Are you? Gonna... And that's why I think. So my bottom line is what I I hope for is that we bring back truly independent research. And we don't have that because pharma money is flowing into the NIH, the CDC and the FDA. And, and, you know, we need something that's truly independent for the people that can address questions that are, you know, not necessarily profit making, but that people need to know. And uh, on YouTube asks, what are the implications of people at Scientific American so easily caving to the biomedical state or even uh, joining as enforcers for approved narratives. So well, here I, I don't know that, you know, I mean, just because something's independent doesn't mean it's going to be right or that we don't all have our own biases that are a problem. And in fact, Shannon and I addressed this um, in the BMJ and then remind me, I want to get to the thing about masks too, but, um, you know, Yes, individual biases can be powerful, and we all know how our own, you know, we have our own opinions, and they're strong, and they can be hard to let go of, and the same is true for researchers. However, industry has a very different effect, and that is that they have a unidirectional effect. So personal biases, one person's going to say this, another person's going to say that, and you put it all together and you assess it. But industry makes sure that the narrative is always in one direction. It's unidirectional. Their product works. And anybody who says otherwise, they either drown out or actually kneecap. And I have a number of examples. I've uh, done a lot on whistleblowers. So you look up Lenser and whistleblowers, you'll find uh, stuff on that. Um, the other thing is, is that they have the power to trot out. Um, their lawyers, their sock puppets, their social media activists, their PR flex, and um, and thereby they can really uh, change what the narrative is. So even if somebody um, exposes something like Shannon and I will be doing about this drug I was just talking about, um, it won't, you know, they'll drown it out. Interesting. Well, let's get, I'm going to pause the audience questions and uh, let's get to the uh, study on masks that you referenced. I think it was the Bang Bangladesh study that came out last year about the efficacy of masks and how that became part of the rationale uh, for masking kids at school in the United States. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about your, your, yeah, so your experience with that study and its author. Yeah. So it wasn't just the Bangladesh study, but that sort of was a capstone by the time we got there. So Tom Jefferson and Carl Hennigan um, in Britain had done um, a lot of research with the Cochrane Institute, which is the Cochrane collaboration, which was largely supposed to be very independent. It's not 100 percent, but they um, the idea is that they didn't want to be an industry source. And so they looked at masking uh, before COVID for flu viruses. And they were unable to find really any significant benefit from uh, masking for flu viruses. If they did, it was marginal, very marginal. Um, so they've been arguing that the whole masking thing is overblown. So we had that in the background. And then the Danes did a study. Um, and that study was of 6,000 people. And um, they found, uh, again, almost no significant difference when they did it. So there's only two randomized control trials, and that was the Danish study and the Bangladesh study. All the other observational studies where people claim, oh, we know masks work. That's based on observational data, and observational data has the exact same problem that the use of COVID deaths has, because you have very different groups who choose to wear masks. You have very different groups of people in certain areas if you observe them and say, well, this state wore masks and this state didn't. 
so you you just can't compare. What you need is a scientific study, and only two scientific studies have been conducted um, of mask wearing and COVID. And um, like I say, the one was Danish, and and I talked to the editor in chief of the Annals of Internal Medicine, which published that study, and they were taken to task for even publishing the study because it didn't find a benefit. And it was sort of like, how dare you publish this? You know, this is going to discourage people. And they said, well, you know, we publish what the facts are as we find them. So it took some courage on their part to do that. The Bangladesh study was massive. And that involved, I think it was like, to look here at my notes, I think it was like, yeah, it was 300, yeah, 342,000 people were in that study. And here they gave away free masks. They did um, all sorts of notifications. They did text messaging. They followed the people around. I mean, they did everything to make sure that masks were worn and were effective and stuff like this. And that study was heralded as proof that kids should be masked. They Masks work was a big headline somewhere. I, I tracked that down. Masks work. Well, let me tell you what the actual facts were from that study and from my written communications with the lead author, there was a 99% failure rate. So the difference between those who wore masks and those who didn't wear masks went from 8.5% to 7.5%. That's a 1% difference. That means that 99% of the wearers achieved no benefit. So you can't say it's no benefit, but we're talking about pretty close to it. On top of that, the people who accrued any benefit were the elderly, not young people. And on top of that, to use this as an excuse to mask children, they excluded anyone under the age of 18. So they never studied it in children. I mean... (laughs) Wow. Um, and so so the, the the eight versus seven, so in the mask wearing group, uh like seven percent caught COVID and in the eight non- percent caught it in the right. in the non-mask wearing group, right. And that's the so one percent that, that is uh that is justifying masking. Yeah. And and so we have to look at where we put resources, too. And one of the things we did not do during this pandemic was to pay health aides decent wages and nurses. So they're desperately taking on three jobs, working three different nursing homes at once, spreading it from nursing home to nursing home because they're so underpaid. Some of them don't even have health care as part of their benefits. I mean, it's tragic, this wealth gap that is driving people to extremes and 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 into poverty. I mean, we have people working in nursing homes who, you know, have to use uh, food stamps. Uh, they, they get paid so little and they do the hardest, most unrewarding work. So it's nutty. We could be using money better ways than filling all our rivers with a bunch of discarded masks, I think. But, you know, not a public health expert. Uh, all right, I'm going to jump back into the uh, audience questions here. Um, and Tomarin86 on Instagram asks, Jean, you mentioned the stress and fear that young people dealt with during uh, COVID. What are your thoughts on the current state of uh, mental health in, in America? Well, here I worry once again, um, back in, um, I forget what year, um, I think it was about 2004-ish, Bush, mm-hmm. uh, President Bush recommended that everyone in the United States be screened for depression. And what that meant was that, and by the way, guess who wrote the screening tool that's used? Every time you go to a doctor and they ask you, have you been depressed lately? That's a screening tool that was devised by the drug company. So guess what happened to drug sales? They went up, up, up. And do we have any evidence that it's really an approach that's working? I think, you know, our focus on drugs is just unhealthy. And so this whole thing, yes, we're all anxious. We're all having troubles during this pandemic. Um, We're worried about a lot of things, all of us. Um, But I think the focus right now that we should start screening everyone, which is what just happened, the USPSTF is now recommending that everyone get screened for anxiety. It means that we're going to start prescribing more drugs. And some people who may benefit and need medicines, and that's fine. But we know that 
getting market share is what the drug companies want. And so they devise these tools. I'll tell you an example. Um, there was a pre, uh, what do you call it? Um, postnatal depression. Okay. So women who get postnatal depression. Now I've never given birth. So I don't know. I just took the little quiz to see, but they phrase the questions in such a way that if you're a human being, if you're alive, if you have feelings, you're going to have to answer yes to at least one or two of those questions. So I got diagnosed with postnatal depression, <laughs> according to the screening tool, which means Maybe I should was, be put on drugs. You know, after giving birth to your, your book. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. All right. Well, um, we've got a question here from Carl Official on Instagram. Where has there been the most damage in, uh, in done in regards to how medical industry has conducted itself uh, during COVID? Um, is it people's trust in authority or people's trust in in science? So science with the quotations, sort of the the science TM. Yeah. Well, I'm sad, 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 sad to see how little scientific understanding of basic, basic concepts there is among the public. And, you know, doctors don't understand, a lot of doctors do not understand critical appraisal of medical research. So they rely on the FDA for, for what they think. But I'll, I'll come back to this issue of trust in science. You know, we we lose the trust of the public when we exaggerate benefits and when we pretend that we have answers. I mean, one of my favorite articles was by a former um, editor-in-chief of the New England Journal who talked about uncertainty and the need to sit with uncertainty, that the drive to get an answer right away is really detrimental. And um, I, I don't see any way out of this mess. I mean, we have people who, you know, they, they believe that there are, you know, uh, what is it, lizard people? I mean, there's not much we can do with that. Um, but scientific principles, basic understanding of, you know, that you want to look at a group of people who have an intervention and you want to separate that group of people from another group of people who are virtually the same and they don't have that intervention or they have a different. In and that's how you learn. That's the only way we have to know. And I want to give another example. Um, I was fascinated by the whole Vioxx debacle. So some of your people too young to remember this, but there's a painkiller, an aspirin-like painkiller called Vioxx. And it turns out that it probably killed about 60,000 people, according to uh, the FDA safety monitor, David Graham. And um, he was shot down. I mean, they really did everything they could to keep him from going public with that um, information. But eventually it did become public and Vioxx had to be withdrawn from the market. But my my question to myself was, I mean, we all prescribed that drug, that painkiller is very commonly used. It was used for millions of people. Why didn't we see the carnage? Why didn't we see those deaths? The answer is actually somebody worked it out mathematically, and I, I wish I could find that study. If anybody knows about it, let me know, because what he did is he looked at the average number of patients that any doctor sees. And if you have a panel of, say, 4,000, 5,000 patients, how many of those patients are going to be elderly? Because those are the people who are taking these painkillers regularly. They took it for arthritis. So, And then of those, how many were likely to die in any one year? So you have seven of your patients who die. And how do you know? Did they die because they were old and going to have a heart attack anyway? Or did they die because they took Vioxx? And one of the most telling examples was one doctor who was in his 50s, a runner, very athletic and healthy. He took Vioxx himself because he believed the propaganda that was in the New England Journal of Medicine about the drug that the drug company had promoted. Um, he took it himself. He prescribed it to a patient. His patient died. Of, his patient had a heart attack, and I don't know if he died or, and his family sued, but the doctor himself developed a heart attack. So he sued the company saying, you misinformed us. So he hurt both the patient and himself. And the only way we discover that is through these large scale studies, these randomized control trials. We can't see it. You can't rely on somebody saying, oh, I've treated lots of people. They're fine. It's not good enough. All right, here. Let's see. Craig Leone on Facebook asks, why is there not a bigger push for exercise and other therapeutic 
remedies, no money in it, question mark. So I guess it's <laughs> well, exactly and studies with regards it. to, uh, you know, COVID and, and uh, what the push for vaccines. Uh, say that Co- again, that COVID last part and about COVID. COVID, and, COVID and the push for, for vaccines that really, you know, you, you must be vaccinated uh, and regardless of whether you've had pre- previous infection oh, or yeah. not, that yeah, natural yeah. immunity is uh, downplayed. Um, but yeah, in, it, I guess it, it could also be beat more broadly. So, well, the first part of the question I think about exercise. So, I mean, there have been studies already showing that workplaces that have gyms, you know, do better. They have less um, sick leave and and problems like that. So, you know, I mean, there are a lot of things that we could do that are for the common good um, that don't get looked at if there isn't a profit motive behind it. And that's where I really believe that we need more public funding for actual public good. Um, as for the the vaccine, yeah, I mean, this is the whole issue of surrogate endpoints. So I'll talk about that for a minute. Um, I remember very early in the pandemic, uh, I asked that very question of one of the leading experts on vaccines. And I said, you know, how do you know that once somebody has COVID, that they're not better protected than with the vaccine, perhaps, or as well protected. And he said, well, we know it because their antibody titers are higher. Well, again, think of antibody titers, like I mentioned the PVCs, those abnormal heartbeats. That's a surrogate endpoint. A surrogate endpoint is what's used almost entirely now by FDA to approve drugs. It's not a finding that you've either extended a patient's life or made them feel better. What it is, is some measure like the size of a tumor, did it shrink? Or the level of glucose in a diabetic or cholesterol in a heart patient. So those things, see, these are, that's where the illusion lies. Yes, we know that high blood sugar and diabetes kills people, but just because you lowered their blood sugar doesn't mean you're not killing the patient's liver. So surrogate endpoints can, only measure benefit. They cannot measure harms. And so this assumption that because we got rid of the nasty thing, we got rid of, you know, the um, tumor size. Yeah, you can shrink a tumor. You can <laughs> uh, you can laser beam it away and kill the patient. We need to know a, a clinical outcome. And that's unfortunately what's been dropped. So the same thing with antibodies. My next question to him was, well, you know, just because the antibody titer is higher, are they doing any better? Are they any less likely to die? And of course, I didn't have the answer to that at that time when I asked the question. But this is typical, the acceptance of a surrogate endpoint as somehow translating into benefit. All right. Well, let's turn in some of the time that we have left to your book, The Danger Within Us. We're going to show that on the screen. Um, (laughs) And I also want people to check out the audio version of it that Jean narrates herself. And I told her if, if this investigative journalism thing doesn't work out, she's got another career as a narrator because it's really <laughs> a, just, just one wonderful voice. Uh, so what was the inspiration behind, behind the book? Well, a patient came to me and um, uh, he said that he had nearly been killed by a medical device And um, he really taught me a lot because I was completely unaware of yet another illusion. And that's exactly what was going on with this device, where everyone assumed that when it was used, it was benefiting the patient and not harming them. And the illusion is so so profound. Okay, so he he was he, he had epilepsy and um, there was this device called a vagus nerve stimulator. And the idea was that it would they would insert this uh, uh, device in just like a pacemaker in under the skin near the collarbone. They'd thread a wire up around the uh, the vagus nerve, and then they'd stimulate it. And the idea was that somehow magically it was going to stop seizures. Nobody knew how or had any science behind it, but they did these studies and alleged that it did. Now here's where things get really tricky in medicine when you say that a drug, we prove this drug has benefit. Benefit in medicine does not mean net benefit. 
So you can pick five different things that a drug does. Say you've got aspirin and it reduces uh, temperature and it reduces inflammation and it reduces pain. So you pick an endpoint out of 20 different endpoints and you, you say that one works. And you're not looking at any of the other endpoints and you're not looking at harms. All you're doing is saying, I found this particular benefit. And here it gets even more bizarre. And that's where it took me a lot of time to catch on to what this patient was saying. That is that the benefit measured was any decrease in seizures. What they didn't mention was that the patient, all the patients overall in these studies almost had an equal number of patients who had increased seizures. But that wasn't, you didn't subtract the increase in seizures from the de decreased seizures. You just announced, well, 30% of people had a 25% reduction in seizures. You don't add, and 29% had a 33% increase in seizures. And I'm not, don't quote me on those numbers, but that's vaguely the arena of what happened. I mean, it's crazy. And, and yeah. it's so confusing, even to doctors, when, when a study is reported as showing benefit, they assume it really means net benefit. When, when you and I talk, if I say, I went, you know, I, I bank with this bank because, you know, it's the best one, I benefit from it. We assume that that means net benefit, that any fees I had to pay were less than, than what I got in interest. But that's not true in medicine. And it, it, that's not true for a reason. I mean, if you give a patient a drug for, to prevent heart attacks and it reduces heart attacks by, say, 10%, that's really something, but it maybe causes liver failure in 1%. You can't quite subtract liver failure from heart attacks. So you, you do have to report benefit and harm separately. But here it was truly bizarre because the benefit and harm was seizures itself, not to mention that it was also causing people's hearts to stop. Yeah, that well, that was what happened <laughs> with the the patient that uh, that got you interested in it and that you followed, and and that was a really interesting yes. story because the device was sort of triggering. Was it every three minutes or so? Yes. And, yeah, and uh, every three minutes he was losing consciousness, and they were like, "Oh, he's just having a seizure every three minutes," but in fact he was uh, having yeah. a massive drop in, in blood pressure, um, right? Leading to- Yeah, exactly. I mean, his, that's what really and, got my interest yeah. is he sent me his EKGs and I, cause I always ask for the medical records of anybody who, you know, I have to vet everything that comes through. And, and uh, I mean, I've worked ERs for many years and you only see a flat line that long when somebody's dead and dying. And it was just stunning to see this happen. Um, and also so followed the, it to through. see- yeah, the uh, in the his, his attempt to challenge and get some kind of um, restitution for this, that the defense was uh, that <laughs> this was not caused by the device, even though um, the the phenomenon stopped when the device was turned off. Right, 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 right. right. So that was like okay. Um, yeah, and then you also point to some sort of structural, uh, as I mentioned before, the kind of the context in which all of this is is happening. And, you know, you and I are, would probably disagree on some of it, but you've done a lot more uh, research and study into it. So uh, you talk about the uh, how Medicare has uh, affected the cost of, of treatment while acknowledging um, some positive aspects of the program. You also point to how fee-for-service aspect uh, of payment has distorted incentives, uh, leading to more tests and more procedures and more pills. So tell us a little bit about that history and that impact. Yeah, my colleague Shannon Brownlee is really much better to address this than I am, but the um, so and she educated me about my illusions about Medicare because I, I thought, well, Medicare, isn't that like socialized medicine and we should have that for everyone. And I didn't realize that it is a fee for service program. And so it can allow for a lot of overtreatment, over testing and things like that. Um, conversely, um, you know, some of the HMO programs, uh, they extract their profit by not delivering services. They promise the world and then don't deliver so that they can extract those. So neither is really a great 
alternatives. So people are talking about, you know, well, let's get rid of the advantage, Medicare Advantage program. So we just have Medicare. They both have problems. And um, I don't think either is a is really a great solution. And as a practitioner, I always emphasized that I don't want my income to be affected by doing more. I don't want to get more money for doing more. And I don't want to get more money for doing less because there was a move to incentivize doctors to um, not do over treatment, not do over testing. I'm like, no, 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 that's the wrong incentive. We need to do it because it's the right thing to do. Fund doctors to, you know, serve a, a panel of patients and just do the right thing. And yeah, we're all going to make mistakes and do the wrong thing and sometimes over treat and sometimes under treat, but there shouldn't be a financial incentive that's driving you in either direction. I don't think a patient who comes into the office wants to believe that the prescription you give or the, you know, surgery that you recommend or whatever um, is going to enrich you or enrich you because you say, no, you don't really need it. Uh, that that would be such an incredible conflict of interest. We wouldn't let a, a, a judge take money from one side, uh, from the prosecution or the defense. Why do we let doctors? How did these changes lead to the rise of the um, hospital-centric system that we have now? Uh, one in which you write that, quote, house calls, uh, house visits went the way of cup bleeding and, and the leech. <laughs> yes, I, yeah. I, I hadn't re realized till I read your book uh, how remarkably the, the way we deliver care has, has changed. Um, yeah, it is a medical industrial complex now. And I feel bad sort of saying this stuff about doctors because by and large, doctors are not driving this problem so much. It is now a medical industrial complex. Most doctors are employees. I believe I'm saying that. I may, I may be wrong. You need to get Shannon Brownlee on your show because she can address this whole, she really focuses on this. Uh, um, what uh, private equity groups are doing, taking over nursing homes, taking over hospitals, and the problems that this is creating. Uh, all right. Well, we do have a lot of libertarians uh, in our audience and, uh, you know, which is about diametric opposite of, of your kind of political perspective. And yeah. so um, I yeah. did want to, you know, we, we, we talked about, you've written about the rampant uh, corruption, elaborate cover ups uh, and the shameless profiteering. Um, wouldn't it be in the rational self-interest of these companies uh, to produce products and services that are better safe and effective with or without oversight uh, in other areas of the marketplace, consumers, you know, steer clear of crummy uh, products and services and um, the com companies that offer them are, are punished by poor reviews, bad press, low sales. So why is the medical device industry so different? Well, not just the medical device, but of course the big pharma as well. Um, and I think that's where illusion comes in that, you know, I'm mean, for consumer is it because goods. They're so, is, it, is it because they're so complex that, uh, you know, that you're able to have these illusions because people aren't experts or medical professionals themselves? And, and so it's just to I think in part, some of the illusions are very seductive. And, and in my Smithsonian article, I, I talk about, you know, I mean, I was seduced by watching the PBCs disappear. I thought I was saving lives. Um, so there are many ways in which we can be seduced by what we think we see and what we think we know. And that's why I'm so adamant about the need for scientific evidence. Um, but, uh, you know, consumer goods, it's one thing. People can see whether they like their sneakers or not, or whether they like their TV or not. Um, what has been shown over and over with and study after study with doctors and patients is that we tend, all of us, to way overestimate the harms of a condition. So we think that if we um, get breast cancer, we're going to die. And a lot of us are going to die. And in fact, wait, I mean, I can't remember the numbers, but it's it's astounding the, the, the gap between what women think about their likelihood of getting ca breast cancer and dying and the actuality. So that's true for both doctors and patients. They think the diseases are worse. And they also think that the interventions are far more beneficial than they are. So you see these things like, oh, this drug 
prevents this deadly disease um, in uh, slashes it in half. And everybody thinks, well, I have to take that. Only problem is if one in a million people were going to die, you know, say you had two in a million people were going to die. And now it's one in a million treating all a million people for something that they weren't going to die of anyway and getting all the side effects. Mm-hmm. So these kinds of illusions, you know, I mean, I, I gave grand rounds to a group of physicians once and I gave them the actual numbers that they needed to come to a conclusion about whether they would want to take this drug or not. And so that, you know, you know, so such and such a percentage would die. This is how much it's going to reduce it. This is how many, what percent will die with it. And I asked them, how many of you would take the drug? And clearly the numbers show that they were more likely to die if they took the drug. They all raised their hand because it just, it, it, there's something called prior probability. And it's very hard for people in, to conceptualize that you need to know what your risk was before you go into something. And so it's it's hard. It's very confusing. And, it, you know, we need a more independent, good science to guide people. All right. Well, we've got about five minutes left. I'm going to squeeze in one more audience question. Then I just would like to end with, um, you know, we've covered a broad variety of, of topics and uh, wanted to allow you to give any final thoughts or any areas uh, that you uh, wanted to elaborate on or that you feel like you haven't been able to address. So from Facebook, Mark Alex Sopolis asks, did the definition of a vaccine uh, and its use get changed due to COVID or have people always had a misconception about what a vaccine is? I don't, I don't think I know an answer to that. In terms of what people think. Uh, I mean, I think that previously people thought that a vaccine was something that you would take and you would gain immunity um, from catching that disease. And now it seems to be, well, you won't necessarily gain immunity from catching that disease, but you will have some benefit in terms of uh, the severity of outcomes. So so anyway, I, I'm not sure that people had a misconception about what vaccines are. So it does seem that it was uh, just even that the dictionary uh, fell victim or in, in this case, um, yeah, yeah, actually the dictionary and, and the CDC definition of um, vaccines were modified uh, based on this all encompassing sweep to uh, make sure that everyone got vaccinated all, you know, 100%, uh, regardless of their risk or, um, in in fact, uh, uh, immunity status. So with that, Jean, this has been wonderful. Any any other thoughts or uh, maybe uh, tell us about your next, are you going to write another book? I certainly hope so. Honestly, I just... I, I just want to thank you for doing this. I mean, it's really a tribute to you that, you know, you make this kind of conversation possible across lines. That's very important. We so need that now. And um, I thank you for your courage in doing that, having me and making it easy to talk. Well, likewise, Jean, uh, first of all, I have a lot of practice as the only Republican and a family of, of uh Democrats. Um, wow. But but also, I mean, I'd say that uh, the pressure is, if anything, even more, you know, intense on people like you that, you know, oh my God, like, or, you know, people that would be on the left and, and uh, that you'd get ostracized if you were to go on to Fox yeah. News or we're, yeah. we're a little bit different because we're not really libertarians. We're, we're, we're more objectivists uh, than anything. So, um, so we, where is the best place for us to follow you and keep uh, keep tabs on on your work? Oh, I left Twitter. Right. I mean that. <laughs> tell you that. I'm tough, but I ain't that tough. Um, so I do have a website, jeanlinzer.com, and uh, yeah, working on my next projects, and something will come out soon enough. Oh, fantastic! We really appreciate it, and also I appreciate all of you who came and listened and asked. Your excellent questions. Again, go out and buy Jean's book or 
listen to the audio version. Uh, I, I definitely know I've made t- at least two sales uh, with this program because uh, the two Dr. Grossmans uh, in this house are going to go and uh, read it. So, so thank you. And uh, thanks to all who have watched. If you are uh, enjoying the kind of content that we provide and the work that we do with introducing young people to Ayn Rand's literatures and philosophy, then tis the season, folks. Uh, just a few more day- days in 2022. So go ahead and make your tax deductible donation to the Atlas Society to support our work. And tune in next week. I'm going to be talking to Professor Israeli professor of psychology, Sam Vaknin, about narcissism and victimhood and its connection to woke ideology. So we'll see you next week on the Atlas Society Asks. Thank you. Thank you so much.